Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcikowski. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us today for the weekly seminar of the Center, this time the Winter Quarter. This is our very first seminar uh, of the Winter Quarter, and we are really, really pleased that you are with us today. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx communities across the Americas. And today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Hernán Galperín is Associate Professor and Director of the Annenberg Research, Net Research Network on International Communication at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Southern California. Facundo Suenzo, a graduate student in the program in Media Technology and Society at Northwestern and a, an, an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media, We'll introduce Hernan in just a minute. But before we do that, I'd like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho Chunk Nations. It was a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and institutions' history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly about how the seminar will unfold. First, in just a few seconds, Facundo will tell us more about Hernan's research and career. Then Hernan will deliver his seminar, and after that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar. Facundo will read them out loud, and Hernan will answer. And at the end, uh, I will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us, and without further ado, Facundo, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Pablo, and hello, everyone. I'm incredibly honored to have been invited <clears throat> today's opening seminar to introduce Professor Nan Galperin and to co-moderate this uh, very promising presentation at the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Professor Galperin is Associate Professor and Assistant Dean for Excellence in Teaching at the Annenberg School for Communication, University of Southern California, where he also directs the Annenberg Research Network on International Communication. Professor Galperin is an internationally recognized expert and in, on internet policy and digital inequality. His research uses surveys, field experiments, and other quantitative methods to understand the determinants of broadband adoption and use, and how these are linked to the mechanisms of social stratification and gender discrimination. Professor Galperin is the author of four books and has published extensively in major journals such as New Media and Society, Telecommunication Policy, Development Policy Review, and the International Journal of Communication, among others. His most recent publication, The Power Divide, Mobile Communication in Los Angeles Skid Row, explores mobile phone and use among people experiencing homelessness in downtown Los Angeles, usage patterns and connectivity challenges, and how this affect access to social services, as well as opportunities for information seeking skill building and social capital formation. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nan Galperin. Thank you, Facundo. Um, thank you, Pablo. And um, thank you, um, everybody at the new Latinx Center at uh, Northwestern for the invitation. It's a, a real, real pleasure to have this opportunity to present <clears throat> my recent work, but also reflect on some of the work uh, in the field of digital inclusion um, as, <clears throat> as it stands today in this very unique times that we are uh, living. What I'm gonna present today is a um, recent um, study in, um, in the context of, of Los Angeles about digital inclusion 
and educational equity in um, during the, the COVID pandemic. Um, but I also will take this opportunity to reflect um, more widely on the field of digital inclusion and, and start with this idea that um, I believe we, we, we've entered a, 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 a new, what I'm calling a golden age for, for research on digital inclusion and internet policy. There's been um, attention to these issues that I haven't seen in several decades. And I think this is for, a, for, a, for a obvious and, and good reason, which is that the COVID pandemic has accelerated the, the blurring of lines between the online and the offline world to the point that I believe conceptually, we can no longer really talk about different worlds of online and offline because all our activities are in, in some way or another a blend of online and offline. So conceptually, uh, we really, uh, the COVID pandemic has accelerated this, this blurring of lines and, and all our activities have in some way or another one component on online and a component of offline. Um, of course, education is the obvious example, but also our, our, our uh, employment and work activities and, and social engagement and political activities, um, health, um, all of those activities now are, have, uh, have, have a blended online and offline uh, components. And, and, and this is obviously, exposing the fact that those who are uh, unconnected, those who have a poor connectivity um, in, 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 in whatever uh, way or don't have the skills are put at a disadvantage, are put at a, at a great disadvantage in a world where, again, the blurring of online and, and offline has, has, um, has, has become very, uh, very apparent. Um, so I think it's a great time to, to talk about digital inclusion and internet policy and, and, and be part of this community of, of researchers. Um, but of course, there's, there's a long tradition of studies. Uh, um, and, and let me take you a little bit through the, the historical context of where this, this started. Um, and what I consider the first wave of, of digital inclusion um, research uh, really began with, with the massification of the internet in the late 90s, the dot-com boom. Um, and what, um, what you see here are some of the seminal studies, um, what some of them uh, studies conducted by uh, the government. This study called Falling Through the Net was incredibly influential. Uh, this was still during the Clinton administration um, and, and highlighted um, what, what, what was apparent at the time, which was that the adoption of the internet at the time was very much uh, determined by, by income, by race and ethnicity, by geography. Um, then came a, a really seminal book um, called The Digital Divide uh, by Pippa Norris. And interesting, um, this is a book uh, by, by not by a media scholar, but by a political science uh, scholar who talk about the digital divide uh, in the context of civic engagement and, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and political um, issues. Um, and it was very influential um, as, as a sort of uh, founding, uh, establishing the basic outlines of, of the, uh, thinking about digital divide. And later on, uh, of course, some of the dissenting voices came in. Um, and this is one I'm highlighting here, a book by, uh, or edited book by Benjamin Combein called The Digital Divide. And I don't know if you can uh, read the subtitle, but the subtitle is very telling because the subtitle says, facing a crisis or creating a myth. So um, this book was arguing that, well, perhaps the digital divide really is a question of a, a natural, evolution of uh, technology adoption. And the idea was that this is what, what, what is happening with um, the internet and, and broadband is what happened with many other technologies in the past where um, at the very beginning, it was only adopted by the, 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 the wealthier and, and, and certain groups. And then over time, this differences and this gaps tended to to disappear and, to, and, and, and adoption rates tended to converge. And 
the idea behind this is that basically if you just wait a little time and the natural evolution of market forces and price drops and network effects and so forth will eventually bring everybody to, to be connected. Um, and, and again, this was quite also influential, particularly in, in Washington in policy circles. And, and this is also the time that we transitioned from the Clinton to the Bush administration in the, in the, in the 2000s. Um, and in fact, um, uh, uh, one of the first, uh, or, or one of the FCC commissioners of the time, uh, uh, Michael Cobbs had a famous uh, phrase about the digital divide where he says, well, the digital divide is, is, is like the Mercedes-Benz device, divide. There's a Mercedes-Benz divide. I want to have a Mercedes-Benz, but I can't afford it. So um, this was a famous statement by, uh, again, an FCC commissioner, but basically saying, well, the internet is a luxury. Um, and, and it's a luxury that some can afford and some cannot afford. Um, and, and obviously he was, he was, he was greatly proven wrong that the, and, and I think the, the COVID pandemic is showing out that is, is far from being a luxury. And we've known this for, for, for a while, but this was a, a, an influential point of view um, <clears throat> at the time. And, and, and the 2000s was sort of a reckoning time for digital um, equity and inclusion research. Um, again, some thinking that the adoption uh, differences will subside over time, that this is a classic diffusion of innovation process. And then others started thinking, well, let's think beyond just access and think about how people are actually using the internet, different ways in which people are using the internet and different skills that people are bringing to the internet. And this is the, uh, what's called the second level digital divide. Uh, and uh, the title here of the article, seminal article by the great uh, Paul DiMaggio uh, is, is, is very illustrative, is uh, digital inequality from unequal access to differentiated use. So the idea was to focus not only on access, but start looking at different ways in which people are using the internet and the different skills that people are bringing or acquiring in the use of internet. And here I, I should actually mention um, that uh, one of the co-authors of this work uh, is of course, Esther Hargitay, which was a faculty at Northwestern for many years uh, and became one of the leading scholars on digital skills and the idea of the second level of digital divide. But, but, but the general idea that, that this, um, this the DiMaggio and others were proposing is that the digital divide is really embedded in the larger context of larger social and economic inequalities. We have to understand this divide as part of a larger set of um, in inequalities. And this is, this is obviously a very uh, interesting and, and, and on its face, it's, it's, it's true, but it does create a lot of challenges for, um, for, um, for studying the digital divide and, 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 and internet adoption. Because once you acknowledge that the digital adoption both reflects but also affects other dimensions of inequality, then it becomes difficult to um, untangle all these different uh, uh, drivers of inequality. And particularly in empirical research, because oftentimes what you can have the digital use on the left side of the equation, on the right side of the equation is a classic endogeneity problem, and it does become a lot more complicated uh, to, to study. No, this is not to say that we shouldn't try, but it does bring a lot more complexity to the study of, of the digital divide. Now, um, after some time, um, the, the field started looking back into the first level digital divide, the basic, uh, the basic uh, access uh, um, and availability of, of the internet, particularly because as, as, as the decade went on, we started realizing that uh, adoption was leveling off. And the, even though everybody was, had more and more access, the relative gaps, um, in terms of gender, race, location, income, and so on, remain quite large. Um, and, and essentially that 
just the market driven model of diffusion would not be enough to to connect everyone um, to the internet. And this is, um, in fact, I, I wrote an article a um, uh, number of years ago called the, the Return of the State, because this is the time when um, a lot of the policymakers, a lot of the states, both in, in Latin America, in the US as well, with the 20, um, 2008 uh, Recovery Act, started really putting some uh, real money into developing national broadband plans and, and taking connectivity uh, to everyone, the idea of universal connectivity more, <clears throat> more seriously. Uh, and this is also the time that we realized that one of the challenges um, in, in digital divide research was how to measure who's connected and who's not and how. Um, and a lot of credit, and I think some, sometimes undue credit, um, is to a scholar named Mark Warshauer, which is actually um, an education scholar at UC Irvine. And Mark uh, was maybe not the first, but, but well, one of the first that really very clearly articulated the fact that internet access, internet adoption is not a yes or no question. That is really, we have to understand uh, access as a continuum of access opportunities, of, dig, of, of devices, of different skills. So, it is not a yes or no, a binary question. Even though we still talk about the digital divide, we probably should really be talking about a digital continuum of different opportunities for access, for uh, engaging with devices and different uh, digital skills. Um, and, and this also became uh, quite evident um, in, in a lot of the survey uh, research. For example, uh, I remember we did um, um, a set of uh, very wide, uh, large surveys in Latin America, across the continent in the, uh, around uh, 2010, 2012, uh, around that decade, and so about 10 years ago. And we quickly realized that it was very uh, difficult to measure, particularly in the context of mobile broadband, because we would ask people, well, have you uh, used the internet in the last, three months. And people say, well, yes, but can you access the internet today? I say, well, I, not today because my prepaid plan has expired. I use all my data and I have to wait until the end of the month to buy more data. But I can use uh, maybe WhatsApp because WhatsApp is zero rated in my plan. So it, it, we realized that even within the same population, internet, uh, access opportunities change over time. It really depended what time of the month you asked the question where this person was connected or was not connected. And maybe it was connected to WhatsApp and email because that was zero rated, but couldn't access other websites or apps because those were not zero rated on their plan. Um, and so in, in the context of growing what is called the appification of the internet, the question of uh, people being connected or not really became a lot more complex to, to in fact measure. Even though again, uh, the service kept asking people, have you used internet in the last three or six months? The question is really a lot more complex than, than the simple yes or no answer to that, to that question. Um, very quickly, and this is, this is actually, uh, Facundo mentioned this paper in the introduction. Um, this is a good illustration of of, of this idea of the, of the measurement problem. Um, so we, we, we did a um, small study in Los Angeles um, in the Skid Row, Skid Row area. The Skid Row area is the epicenter of the homelessness uh, pandemic, you can call it, in Los Angeles. There's over 60,000 people in the, at, at any point in time in, uh, in Los Angeles living uh, on the streets and shelters and so on. And so we wanted to understand um, uh, internet use and mobile phone use in this population. And uh, we did a survey and we asked people, have you used the internet in the last um, three months? And about 87% of the people said, yes, I've used the internet in the last three months. And this number we compare to Pew Research and others, and it's very, uh, very much, it's very similar to the general population. So the, the conclusion that you can draw from here is that, well, the internet use among the homeless uh, um, is really not very different from general population. But when, when you dig deeper into the problem, it is very, diff uh, very different because uh, what, what it characterizes 
internet use among the homeless is what we call access instability. And we really borrow here from the idea in homelessness studies of housing stability, because the same ha happens in the homeless, which is, it's not a question of yes or no. There's, there's a continuum of, of housing instability um, among the population. And the same happens in terms of access. There's a continuum of access instability. Um, uh, folks have data caps through different government programs where they can use um, the mobile plans up to a certain point, and after that, they can't use it anymore. Devices are actually fairly easy to get through Lifeline and other programs, but they're often broken, stolen devices, police raids. Um, and probably one of the most surprising findings is that for this population, charging is an issue. So because they don't have a home, they have nowhere to charge their phone. Um, here's a picture of um, some folks trying to charge their phone on the metro, despite the fact that the police would actually ticket them for charging phones on the metro. Um, and, and, and really, the, the ability to use it was very much dependent on whether they had a charge or not. That's the title uh, of the paper, The Power uh, <clears throat> Divide, which power really refers to not the social power, but really the actual power of powering the devices. That is a really um, um, widespread challenge among this population. <clears throat> and, and, and overall, we find that the more people have uh, or struggle with access instability, this reduces their ability to connect to resources for, for, for the homeless, but also to build and maintain social ties. And this is very clear in the literature that uh, for those who are struggling with homelessness, the more they're able to maintain ties with those that are not homeless, family, friends who are not homeless. So if you will, the, the, the key here is not so much bonding social capital, but the bridge in social capital. The more they are able to keep that connection with family and friends who are not homeless, the, the more likely they are to transition <clears throat> out of homelessness. <clears throat> so again, small scale study, but really speaks to the fact that measuring the digital divide really is not a simple binary question, but we have to account for this idea of access instability and the continuum of access opportunities that exist in this, <clears throat> in this uh, population. And of course, something that also changed um, <clears throat> around this time in the, in the early, about a decade ago, in 20, around 2010, is that uh, because uh, of, of new data availability uh, about infrastructure deployment, uh, the FCC leading the charge in the United States, but also other agencies at the state level, we were able to understand much better where infrastructure was available to whom and what price. And this allowed um, digital divide researchers to look at the other side, the supply side, and uncover a lot of the inequality in broadband availability and competition and service quality. And basically uh, uncover the, uh, the fact that the, poverty are pay, uh, the poor are paying a penalty, the famous poverty penalty, the same way that the poor have to buy in small supermarkets uh, at a higher price because the larger supermarkets will not uh, be near where they live. The same thing happens with broadband, that they pay a broadband, uh, a poverty penalty in terms of service availability because uh, they tend to live in neighborhoods in areas where broadband is less available, there's less competition and service quality uh, is, is inferior. Um, my last point here is I wish we could do the same in many Latin American countries of the same granularity of data uh, but unfortunately, it's not available, and, and we can talk in the Q&A why this is the fact, but in Latin America, uh, sometimes the most you can get is data disaggregated on, on broadband availability, disaggregated at the level of the uh, states or provinces, maybe municipalities, but large municipalities like Rio and Sao Paulo, for example, that really don't mean much, uh, whereas in the, in the United States, um, the level is at the, at the level of the, essentially the, the, the block, the census block. So it, it's a very um, uh, uh, a large gap between the, the availability of data uh, that we exist in, in Latin America. And we, we can discuss a little more in the Q&A why, why this is the case and why we need much better data to, to be able to understand the digital divide in, in, in the region. 
Now, COVID has obviously changed so much um, of, of our lives and uh, has really made broadband essential infrastructure for, for work, for education, for, for civic engagement, and also showed us the fragility uh, in which many millions live in terms of their connectivity and, 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 and really how, how digital inclusion after 25 years of efforts have still fallen quite short. And, and, um, and there's really been a, let's call it a double whammy for, for those who are poorly connected because not only they lost income, lost employment, they are the hardest hit by the pandemic, but also these are the populations that tend to rely more on public spaces for access. They rely on schools, they rely on work. A lot of people, especially in Latin America, a lot of people tell us in the surveys, I don't need uh, broadband at home because I can, I can connect at work or I can connect at, the, uh, at school, at the university. In the United States, libraries play a big role. Of course, the Starbucks and cafes and so on, all these places now are closed. So all these opportunities for connectivity uh, are now closed. So there's really been a, a, a big, uh, uh, a dramatic shift in the opportunity uh, uh, for connection for, 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 for this population. And let me skip this. And, and obviously the, the, one of the, one of the uh, areas that you can see this better is education. There's probably no, no, no better illustration of, of how much we've become broadband dependent and internet dependent than the world of education with the closure of most uh, schools uh, in the United States and also in, in Latin America and, and most of the world. Um, and with education, um, when, when we started this, this research, um, one of the phrases that, that kept coming back to me was this idea of schools being, you know, the, 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 the drama and, 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 the, and the tragedy of schools being closed is because schools are the great equalizer. So I became, I became interested in this idea of well, what is this great equalizer? And it really um, uh, took, me, took me a little Googling to, to, to find out that it's, it's, it's um, a phrase by R.S. Mann, which uh, it's one of the great champions of public education in, uh, in America. Um, I believe it's sort of the equivalent of, I think every country in Latin America, we, we have in Argentina, Sarmiento, and I'm sure there's others in, in other countries in Latin America, which have the, I uh, associated with the growth and the champions of public education. Well, here in the United States is uh, Horace Mann, who, who, who had this neat phrase about education um, as, as the great equalizer of conditions of man. It's, it's the equalizer of the, the, the balance wheel of the social machinery, which, which um, uh, illustrates or, 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 or expands on the idea that even though uh, uh, um, there is there is great inequality in society, there is an opportunity to 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 try to mitigate the inequality by detaching uh, students from their 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 uh, their uh, home condition and where they're coming from, their background and. And, and providing them the same uh, educational opportunities. Of course, this is more aspirational than reality, but it does illustrate what is, at the end of the day, some of the great purposes of public education. And, 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 and the real tragedy of, of closure of schools and, and, and K-12 in particular uh, during COVID is that when the home turns into a classroom and parents are expected to be somewhat of substitute teachers, school is no longer the great equalizer. So all this great idea of equalization by taking uh, children out of their home context and putting them in the same uh, educational institution um, is, is no longer true because remote learning brings again to the foreground all the pre-existing inequalities that impact student learning. And though this is what we study in, our, in, our, um, um, in this paper, which is the differences in, in connectivity and devices, which is the most obvious way, the most obvious way in which remote learning is bringing to the foreground this uh, inequalities that preexisted, um, because uh, uh, some children would be much better connected than others in their home context. Of course, there's differences in digital skills and the amount of support that you can get at home uh, from parents who may have to work outside the home and may not be able to support children, may have very little experience with computers themselves, and of course, issues of physical space and so on. So there's so many ways in which 
remote learning is bringing back the school into the home and then as a result uh, foregrounding so, uh, so many of these pre-existing inequalities that impact student learning. So this is why the big context of our study. Um, and just to give you an idea of what these pre-existing differences are in the case of, of California, um, these are uh, on the left side, you see the uh, availability of uh, high-speed internet and PC by different income decils. And you can see obvious differences between the first and the and bottom and the top income decil in terms of connectivity. Um, another way in, in the school context that is very common is to look at students that have access to free or reduced price lunch and those that don't. And you see the same differences um, by, by income. But interestingly, when you look at the data, it's not just income. Uh, we think a lot about income and it's very much relevant, but it's not just income. Um, and this is a very, I'm gonna skip this, this is a, a very interesting um, chart here. So here we, we build a, a simple logic model. So we, we model the probability that a household would have a PC and high-speed internet um, by different levels of income. There's other controls here, but I'm just, highlighting uh, income as, and we plot this over income, but we separate Hispanic and non-Hispanic students. And you can see here that, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor here, but you can see here that at the, at the same level of income, uh, let's say at the, at the median income in California, which is about $70,000 uh, a year. So at the $70,000 income, there's an enormous difference. There's uh, a non-Hispanic student is about 90% likely to have a PC and high-speed internet, whereas a non-Hispanic student is only about 70% likely to have PC and high-speed internet at the same level of income. Um, so this, this raises a lot of questions about the fact that it's not just income that is determining the opportunities for access. And we can talk more in the Q&A of why this may be the case. We have some hypotheses about why this is, uh, we see these differences in uh, in, in, in the data. But let me uh, turn in this probably last uh, 10 minutes of my talk about the actual study we did. So we, we partnered with an organization um, in Los Angeles um, called Partnership for LA Schools. They are an organization that manages 19 LAUSD schools. So they're, they're not charter schools, they're not private schools, they're public schools in LAUSD, some of the poorest neighborhoods in LA, some of the most underserved neighborhoods. They simply manage um, those schools. And we partner with them uh, to administer a telephone survey uh, to, um, to these families. Um, and, and we combine that with this, um, data from, from the schools and GPA and, and language, um, language learning status and, and special education status and so on. About uh, the, the, the total population is about 14,000 students. Um, here you can see 90% black, um, sorry, 90% Hispanic, 90% black. So essentially all uh, underrepresented minorities, a uh, quarter of them are English learners, 96% on free and reduced price lines. So essentially very um, a disadvantaged uh, population that we are studying. Just quickly, th this, is, this is where we did a study in three areas, East LA, South LA and Watts. South LA and Watts uh, historically uh, black neighborhoods and East LA, historically a Latino neighborhood in Los Angeles. And you can see some of the lowest levels of connectivity in, in the area precisely in South LA and East LA. These, is, these are the sites where the schools are located. Um, so quickly the goals were to understand how remote learning uh, is impacting the low income, mostly Hispanic families. Um, and particularly in terms of engagement learning outcomes um, and because we were partnering with the school organization, we wanted to understand what, what can we do to improve learning outcomes in, um, in the school year. Um, we did a random stratified sample. So we divided in, in the three areas, uh, South LA, Watts, and East LA, but also by grade level. So elementary, middle, high school, of course, survey was administered both English and Spanish. Um, um, so this was in July, 2020. So this was, in the summer, so was reflecting the experience of the families in the, in the first 
transition to remote learning between March and June, which is the, what the school year was uh, here in uh, LAUSD. We ended up with about 1,200 uh, completed surveys. Quickly, just to get a sense of the impact of the of the COVID uh, on these families, and, and this is in July, so if you probably ask today, you'll probably be higher. But we were we were um, surprised here that a quarter of families said they had an impact on employment. Seventy percent of families had issues with food security. Housing and health was not impacted too much at the time, but that probably is. This was early in the pandemic. Again, this was in in, in July, so very widespread impact on on livelihoods for these families. Let me actually skip here for the sake of time to uh, how we, we measured um, our, our main outcomes. So the, the, the challenge here was that uh, in LAUSD, um, as, as in most other school districts, basically grades didn't matter after March 2020. Uh, so you couldn't get a, a lower grade than you had in March 2020. So basically, uh, it didn't make any sense to look at grades. So we essentially decided to use two proxies to understand learning outcomes. And these are proxies that the literature shows that correlate quite uh, well with, uh, with learning outcomes and achievement, which is uh, student motivation and, and completion of assignments. So essentially, we asked how motivated was the student and, and how many assignments or the, the uh, to what degree the, the, the student was able to complete all the assignments uh, given by, by the school. So these are our two outcome measures in, in, in the study. And, and our theoretical background was really coming from uh, studies of uh, remote learning in Quay 12, which interestingly weren't, weren't that many. There weren't that many studies of remote learning and online learning in the K-12 context. There's a lot in the university and college context, but not a lot in the K-12 context. But there were some studies and the studies really emphasized what, 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 I, um, what they call the, the idea or the, percept, the concept of perception of connectedness, connectedness. And the idea is that the more students feel connected, perceive they're connected with the teachers and, and peers, the better uh, online learning outcomes uh, result. Um, and of course, perception of connectedness is enhanced by synchronous activities where uh, class and teachers and students are participating synchronously, that is via Zoom, via whatever it is, but they are participating at the same time in real time in instructional activities. And this is particularly important for young children because younger children, elementary school children are obviously less capable of the type of independent learning that comes with more maturity in middle um, and high, high school. So connectedness is even more critical for the younger uh, children. So this is what the research was showing. So we, we set out to, to, to uh, understand uh, or, or propose this hypothesis that the, the number of hours of live instruction was, was correlated with assignment completion and motivation. And of course, live of, number of hours of, of live instruction is, is greatly dependent on the opportunity for connectivity and the ability for households and students to connect to, to this uh, live instruction. Um, and the correlation, again, it would be strongly in, in the early grades in elementary school. Um, the empirical, empirical strategy was a straightforward logic um, regression with, with school level effects. Uh, so we control by schools um, and then we all control by all this uh, demographics and connectivity at home, parental education, uh, and some of the administrative data, GPA and so on that we got from the schools. Um, let me skip the table and go straight to what I think is the, the one graph that really illustrates the main result, which is this is the conditional probability. So that the, the probability that the students are reporting that they completed all the school work over the number of live instruction minutes per week that they were receiving. And uh, the, <clears throat> the dotted line is elementary and the, uh, the other line is middle and high school. And you can see that e there is an effect, the more live instruction hours 
That is the more synchronous activities, the more they are basically on Zoom and other synchronous activities, uh, the more they report completing all the uh, school assignments. And this is even more important for elementary schools as we predicted because elementary school uh, students are more dependent on this idea of, of the being connected. They need to really feel and be connected to teachers and peers in order to be motivated and complete um, schoolwork. Um, so the takeaway really is that the, the better connected students can more readily participate in synchronous learning and synchronous learning correlates with student motivation and assignment completion, which are two predictors of learning outcomes. Um, so the takeaways, and, and, and here I use uh, um, something that I heard first from, and I don't know who came up with this, but I heard it first from a, a colleague uh, um, in Argentina at Universidad de Tela, um, Claudia Romero, and she talked that, she said, they were in Argentina, what, what we had it during the pandemic, was really two types of schools, the Zoom schools for the welfare kids, where they're having live instruction, and the WhatsApp school. The WhatsApp school is when they were not having live instruction and maybe the school was delivering packets to students and teachers were trying to keep up by sending uh, WhatsApp messages to students and families. So there were two completely different systems of education. Those for the wealthy that were able to sit in front of a computer and have class over Zoom, and those that didn't and had the, what she called the WhatsApp education. So this is very much reflected in our findings that how much live instruction matters. And obviously that depends on the ability and the preparedness for digital instruction and, re and remote learning um, in uh, the household. Um, so um, our takeaway is uh, access and stability is, is really a key barrier to effective online learning um, and, and without a minimal level of digital infrastructure, uh, uh, there's, there, it's impossible in this context to guarantee equal opportunity in education. Now, what will happen after COVID? I think it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting question. It's a question that we, we are asking ourselves and, and I would, uh, I think it's a, it's a good kickoff for our conversation in, um, in our Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amnan. This was very interesting and um, thoughtful presentation. Uh, so uh, I, well, the, the, the participant can ask their question um, in the Q&A, uh, but I will <coughs> use my privilege or commodating this to start with my questions. Um, at the beginning, uh, Amnan, you mentioned this idea of the return of the state. Uh, do you think that, and considering that your study uh, was in July and there is like a period in which the students kind of return to uh, schooling, do you think that uh, there is a space for, in, in the current times, for this idea of the return to the state uh, to, to assure uh, access, to assure skills in students? Uh, do you think that has to be different? In which way do you consider that? This, this space of the state uh, can take place today. Yeah. Um, thank you, Facundo, for the question. Um, what we've seen um, both in the United States um, and in Latin America, we actually have, we actually have a, a, a small paper coming out uh, where we map some of the uh, uh, policies that uh, states, uh, the, the countries in Latin America have put in place uh, to uh, uh, to, to ensure uh, uh, some level of connectivity in the population. Uh, but what we've seen is that in, in most countries, we've seen a lot of what we call Band-Aid and emergency uh, uh, initiatives. So uh, not, allow, uh, 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 not allowing ISPs to disconnect people for a number of months or uh, trying to offer a, a, a minimum level of uh, connectivity uh, through hotspots for a certain period of time. So um, it, it really accelerated a lot of the, um, a lot of the initiatives that uh, schools and, 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 and uh, states and sometimes federal government had uh, already um, in place, um, but, a lot of them are fairly short-lived. 
Um, even the, um, so the latest package, for example, in, in here in Congress in the United States that passed, the latest release package has an emergency broadband subsidy. It's actually quite generous. It's, it's $50 a month of subsidy for broadband for low income folks. It's fairly generous. Now, when you do the math, uh, $50 a month for all those that will be eligible will last for only about four or five months. It's not, it's, it's something. And we'll get people through the school year, at least in the United States. But what happens after that? So the question is, is really, um, is, this, is this pandemic going to, um, going to uh, or, or are our countries as, as a result of the pandemic going to really um, provide uh, the opportunities and, and the programs to connect millions and millions of people for the long term, not just for the duration of this pandemic? And this is, I think, one of, one of the questions that, uh, or the, the main question. Again, we've seen a lot of Band-Aid and emergency um, initiatives, which are great and are needed, but, but the long-term question remains. Thank you, Herman. Um, I encourage, uh, again, to the people to don't be shy and write your question on the q &A. Uh, There, we have one. Uh, I will read the question. Uh, he said, data access in Latin America is always an issue. How do, we, how do we solve this problem to accomplish more generalizable studies about online divided? Thank you, yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's a tragedy. It's not, not an issue, it's a tragedy because, um, and here's what I've been saying for many years is that I, I understand that maybe uh, countries in, in Latin America cannot afford to uh, pay for a $50 broadband subsidy or to deploy fiber infrastructure pay, paid by the government. Yes, I understand that. We, we have very limited resources, but this is not about resources. This is about regulatory capacity. This is about the capacity of uh, regulators, telecom regulators in Latin America to simply go to the incumbent, which are very few typically, uh, typically uh, three or four incumbents control 80 or 90% of the market and say, I wanna know where you're providing service, with what technology uh, and, and who is subscribing. So it, it, does not, it does not involve actual resources as it involves a regulatory capacity. And even the toughest governments in the region, the, the, the governments that, that, that are said to be more, um, um, anti-capitalism and so on have not gone this way. Um, and it puzzles me why, why, why governments are still afraid of, uh, regulators are still uh, not demanding more data from the incumbents, which is what, what, what happens in, 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 in the United States. It's not the FCC that collects this data. The FCC simply tells the operators to share the data with, with the regulators. Um, so I think it's, it's Part of it is a tragedy of, 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 of the, the, the lack of regulatory capacity in the region. Um, now, there's been some improvements, uh, mostly through census offices in the region. So more and more we have um, uh, the regular um, national household surveys in the region that have more questions about uh, internet access. So that gives some granularity and some more uh, uh, um, so, some better quality data, um, but it's and it's also it's also incumbent on researchers to to try to fund their own surveys and their own research on this. So uh, it, it is an issue. I think um, again, I think we should not give up and 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 keep pushing for more regulatory capacity. Uh, mm -hmm. To, to, to really compel the companies and, and the private sector to collaborate. The, it, it's really a question of collaboration between public and private sector, which is um, often not, not something that we do well in Latin America. Thank you, Arman. Uh We have another question from Mora, who recently read that in the UK, the BBC will offer remote learning for children via their broadcast programming. Uh, and she asked if, if there is any evidence about the combination of different media, traditional and digital, 
for enhancing remote learning programs? That's a good question. I know I, um, um, thank you, Mora, for that question. Um, I haven't seen, you know, uh, I don't know. The answer is honestly, I, I don't know. I think it will be interesting. Um, I, I skipped one slide, um, but, but let, let me just, um, going back to the slide that I skipped, the, the slide had some, um, basically the, 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 this is obviously not the first time that, the, 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 that we think about technology in classrooms. There's, there's at least 50 decades of, of, of work on, on technology uh, and, and education, television, and, 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 and then radio, and then and the internet. Um, there's, there's been somewhat of a, of a difficult, I would say, and, and, um, and, and fraud relation between ICT uh, technology initiatives and the educational community, in part because some of the results are quite inconclusive and mixed. Uh, meaning that uh, sometimes uh, technology uh, governments and technology companies push really hard for more and more educational base, more, educa uh, more educational technology. But when you look at the results in terms of learning outcomes, they are at mixed at, at best. Um, and, and why are they mixed? It's, well, some argue that it's because we're looking at the wrong uh, outcome measures because we tend to look at uh, standardized test scores. Um, but, but, but the reality is it's, it's um, th there are so many needs in the educational system that in order to make a case for, for technology in the education system, there has to be more and better research that shows how this is critical. I think the pandemic is making this quite apparent, uh, but, but the results of studies have, have been quite mixed in terms of so far, in terms of whether, basically whether technology is a smart investment over teacher training and reducing class size and fixing the roof of the school. And so, so that's, um, I think, and again, going back to my idea, I think we now may, may be able to do more of that in this new, uh, what I'm calling the new golden age of digital inclusion. Hopefully we'll have a better, better studies to support uh, and to argue for uh, technology investments uh, in the school context. Thank you, Nan. We, we have very, the last question. Uh, and it said, the idea of Zoom versus WhatsApp is very interesting. Do you think that mobile and app chat access, which was thought to be a solution for countries with low resources, is not, a, is not an effective answer when talking about education or real access to services via online? Well, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's something that, um, it's, it's obviously not, not the golden standard. Uh, mobile access and, and uh, hotspot access is, is not the golden standard. Um, of course, is it, WhatsApp education is better than no education, and it's better than than, than children dropping uh, out of school. And we know that once uh, students disengage from school, um, it's many will not come back. And this is, I think, one of the, the things that we we ought to really pay attention in the post COVID context is um, what what happens with the students that disengage from the system. Uh, uh, so having them engage with WhatsApp and, and mobile devices is better than, than no engagement. But, but it's, it's quite, it, it does exacerbate the difference between those that have been able to maintain a regular contact and synchronous activities with their teachers and somewhat of a regular school hours and those that simply were left to the, the intermittent, intermittent contact through WhatsApp um, with teachers and, and, and peers. Thank you very much, Alan, for a great presentation. We are at time. There is one more question uh, that I wonder if you could uh, answer uh, quite rapidly. Now there are two. The questions now start popping up once uh, we are almost at time. I'm going to read them out loud, and maybe you can give very brief answers. Uh, answers to both. Uh, the first one yeah, says, you referred to some authors until the end of the 2000s. Who would be those of this moment? That's the first question. 
Uh, second question, have you tested the role of teachers unions in accepting or not the use of technology in the pandemic context? Let, let me start with the, the, the difficult one, the teachers unions. Uh, of course, teachers um, are, are part of the, 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 the question um, and, 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 and many have resisted investments in technology because uh, uh, for, for, for good reasons, uh, uh, the sense is that with so many needs uh, in the school context is really technology the, 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 the smartest investment. Um, and, and, and many, many programs have invested in technology without the investment in human capital. In, in human capital means teacher training. Um, so um, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer to the question, but uh, rather than to say that, that yes, the, the, the involvement of teachers has probably been one of the weak points in many uh, technology initiatives. Now, this again may be the opportunity because now uh, in this context, teachers uh, had no choice but to use technology. So maybe this is the point where again, it's accelerated a transition um, and will now open up more opportunities to, to, for remote learning and for uh, all kinds of online uh, education activities, even in a post-COVID context. Um, first question about authors. Um, let me put them in the chat. I, I, I would like to uh, um, think a little bit about that and maybe I can, I can put them in the chat. Um, after, is that, is that, is that? Absolutely, we can, yeah, we can, yeah, we can make okay. that. So with that, thank you very much, Arnan, for a fascinating and very timely uh, presentation. Thank you, Facundo, for a great introduction and moderation. Uh, thanks, everybody in the audience, for staying with us this hour. And I invite you to join us again next uh, Thursday, uh, when we'll have Sebastián Valenzuela from Pontificia Universidad Católica in Santiago de Chile. Uh, present about his work in this uh, winter series of the Center for Latinx Digital Media Seminar Series. Have a great uh, rest of your days. Bye now.